Black Clock Audio Tales April 1st through the 30th 30 days of epic Greek poem, prayers, and parody, Homeric poems from ancient Greece, and then bat rack o moyo machia Brought to you by BunnySlippers.com. Check out their Dino Sound Slippers. You heard what they are. They make noise when you walk around. They look like dinosaurs, and they fit most of your feet. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter or a novel, or a whole story all at once. Join us as we explore all kinds of cool, spooky stories, folklore, epic uh, Greek narratives such as the Iliad. Look for our podcast near, uh, I don't know, the loose stone by the river. Or wherever you find your podcasts. We suggest Podbean, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher. Oh, we're also now on um, Spottable. So check us out on Spottable. Find us at PGTTCM and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and Black Clock Audio Tales on the YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Check out our new website over at PGTTCM. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. Help support the show by going to paypal.me slash pgttcm and donate a buck or five to pgttcm.podbean.com or become a patron. Buy a cool shirt from pgttcm.threadless.com. Black Clock Audio Tales is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Learn more at darkmyths.org. Thank you and enjoy. The Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, Book 13. Neptune helps the Achaeans, the feats of Idomeneus, Hector at the ships. Now when Jove had thus brought Hector and the Trojans to the ships, he left them to the never-ending toil and turned his keen eyes away, looking else withered towards the horse breeders of Thrace, the Mysians, fighters at close quarters, the noble Hippomolgi who live on milk, and the Albians just test the mankind. He no longer turned so much as a glance toward Troy, for he did not think that any of the immortals would go and help either Trojans or Danians. But King Neptune had kept no blind lookout. He had been looking admirably on the battle from his seat on the topmost crests of wooded Samothrace, whence he could see all Ida with the city of Priam and the ships of the Achaeans. He had come from under the sea and had taken his place here, for he pitied the Achaeans who were being overcome by the Trojans, and he was furiously angry with Jove. Presently, he came down from his post on the mountaintop, and as he strode swiftly onwards, the high hills and the forest quaked beneath the tread of his immortal feet. Three strides he took, and with the fourth he reached his gold, Aegi, where is his glittering golden palace imperishable in the depths of the sea. When he got there, he yoked his fleet brazen-footed steeds with their manes of gold fall flying in the wind. He clothed himself in raiment of gold, grasped his gold whip, and took a stand upon his chariot. As he went his way over the waves, the sea monsters left their lairs, for they knew their lord, and came gambling round him from every quarter of the deep, while the sea in her gladness opened a path before his chariot. So lightly did the horses fly that the bronze axle of the car was not even wet beneath it, and thus his bounding steeds took him to the ships of the Achaeans. Now there is a certain huge cavern in the depths of the sea midway between Tenedos and rocky Imbrus. Here Neptune, lord of the earthquake, stayed his horses, unyoked them, and set before them their ambrosial forage. He hobbled their feet with hobbles of gold, which none could either unloose or break, so that they might stay there in their place until the Lord should return. This done, he went his way to the host of the Achaeans. Now the Trojans followed Hector, son of Priam, in close array like a storm cloud or flame of fire, fighting with might and main and raising the cry battle, for they deemed that they should take the ship to the Achaean and kill all their chiefest heroes then and there. Meanwhile, Earth-encircling Neptune, lord of the earthquake, cheered on the Argives, for he had come up out of the sea and had assumed the form and voice of Calchas. First he spoke to the two Ajaxes, who were doing their best already, and said, Ajaxes, you too can be the saving of the Achaeans if you will put out all your strength and not let yourselves be daunted. I am not afraid that the children who have got over the wall in force will be victorious in any other part, for the Achaeans can hold all of them in check. 
But I much fear that some evil will befall us here where furious Hector, who boasts himself the son of great Jove himself, is leading them on like a pillar of flame. May some god then put it into your hearts to make a firm stand here and to incite others to do the like. In this case, you will drive him from the ships, even though he be inspired by Jove himself. As he spoke, the earth-encircling lord of the earthquake struck both of them with his scepter and filled their hearts with daring. He made their legs light and active, as also their hands and their feet. Then, as the soaring falcon poises on the wing high above some sheer rock and presently swoops down to chase some bird over the plain, even so did Neptune, lord of the earthquake, wing his flight into the air and leave them. Of the two, swift Ajax, son of Oilus, was the first to know who it was that had been speaking with them, and said to Ajax, son of Telamon, Ajax, this is one of the gods that dwell on Olympus, who in the likeness of the prophet is bidding us fight hard by our ships. It was not Calchas, the seer and diviner of omens. I knew him at once by his feet and knees as he turned away, for the gods are soon recognized. Moreover, I feel the lust of battle burn more fiercely within me, while my hands and my feet under me are more eager for the fray. And Ajax, son of Telamon, answered, I too feel my hands grasp my spear more firmly, my strength is greater, and my feet more nimble. I long, moreover, to meet furious Hector, son of Priam, even in single combat. Thus did they converse, exulting in the hunger after battle with which the gods had filled them. Meanwhile... The earth encircler roused the Achaeans, who were resting in the rear by the ships, overcome at once by hard fighting and by grief at seeing that the Trojans had got over the wall in force. Tears began falling from their eyes as they beheld them, for they made sure that they should not escape us to destruction. But the lord of the earthquake passed lightly among them and urged their battalions to the front. First he went up to Teucer and Laetus, the hero Pinellus, and Thoas and Apirus, Meriones and Antilochus, valiant waters, all did he exhort. Shame on you, young Argives, he cried. It was on your prowess I relied for the saving of our ships. If you fight not with might and main, this very day will see us overcome by the Trojans. Of a truth my eyes behold a great and terrible portent, which I had never thought to see. The Trojans at our ships, they, who were heretofore like panic-stricken hinds, the prey of jackals and wolves in a forest, with no strength but in flight, for they cannot defend themselves. Hitherto, the Trojans dared not for one moment face the attack of the Achaeans, but now they have sallied far from their city and are fighting at our very ships through the cowardice of our leader and the disaffection of the people themselves, who in their discontent care not to fight in defense of the ships but are being slaughtered near them. True. King Agamemnon, son of Atreus, is the cause of our disaster by having insulted the son of Peleus. Still, this is no reason why we should leave off fighting. Let us be quick to heal, for the hearts of the brave heal quickly. You do ill to be thus remiss, you who are the finest soldiers in our whole army. I blame no man for keeping out of battle if he is a weakling, but I am indignant with such men as you are. My good friends, matters will soon become even worse through this slackness. Think, each one of you, of his honor and credit, for the hazard of the fight is extreme. Great Hector is now fighting at our ships. He has broken through the gates and the strong bolt that held them. Thus did the earth encircler address the Achaeans and urge them on. Thereon round the two Ajaxes there gathered strong bands of men, of whom not even Mars nor Minerva, marshaller of hosts, could make light if they went among them, for they were the picked men of all those who were now awaiting at the onset of Hector and the Trojans. They made a living fence, spear to spear, shield to shield, buckler to buckler, helmet to helmet, and man to man. The horsehair crests on their gleaming helmets touched one another as they nodded forward. So closely serried were they, the spears they brandished and their strong hands were interlaced, and their hearts were set on battle. The Trojans advanced in a dense body, with Hector at their head, pressing right on as a rock that comes thundering down the side of some mountain from whose brow the winter torrents have torn it. The foundations of the dull thing have been loosened by floods of rain, and as it bounds headlong on its way, the whole forest is set in an uproar. It swerves neither to right nor left till it reaches level ground, but then, for all its fury, cannot go further. Even so easily did Hector for a while seem as though he would career through the tents and ships of the Achaeans till he had reached the sea in his murderous course. But the closely serried battalion stayed with him when he reached them, for the sons of the Achaeans thrust at him with swords and spears pointed at both ends, and drove him from them, so he staggered and gave ground. Thereon he shouted to the Trojans, 
Trojans, Lycians, and Dardanians, fight in close combat. Stand firm. The Achaeans have set themselves as a wall against me, but they will not check me for long. They will give ground before me if the mightiest of the gods, the thundering spouse of Juno, has indeed inspired my onset. With these words, he put heart and soul into them all. Deophobus, son of Priam, went about among them, intent on deeds of daring with his round shield before him, under cover of which he strode quickly forward. Meriones took aim at him with a spear, nor did he fail to hit the broad orb of oxide. But he was far from piercing it, for the spear broke in two pieces long ere he could do so. Moreover, Deophobus had seen it coming, and has held his shield well away from him. Meriones drew back under cover of his comrades, angry alike at having failed to vanquish Deophobus, and having broken his spear. He turned therefore towards the ships and tents to fetch a spear which he had left behind in his tent. The others continued fighting, and the cry of the battle rose up into the heavens. Teucer, son of Telamon, was the first to kill his man, to wit, the warrior Imbrius, son of Mentor, rich in horses. Until the Achaeans came, he had lived in Pideum, and had married Metiscasti, a bastard daughter of Priam. But on the arrival of the Danian fleet, he had gone back to Ilius, and was a great man among the Trojans, dwelling near Priam himself, who gave him like honor with his own son. The son of Telamon now struck him under the ear with a spear, which he then drew back again, and Imbrius fell headlong as an ash tree when it is felled on the crest of some high mountain beacon, and its delicate green foliage comes toppling down to the ground. Thus did he fall, with his bronzed white armor ringing harshly around him, and Teucer sprang forward with intent to strip him of his armor, but as he was doing so, Hector took aim at him with his spear. Teucer saw the spear coming, and swerved aside whereupon it hit Amphimachus, son of Cetaceus, son of Actor, in the chest as he was coming into battle, and his armor rang rattling around him as he fell heavily to the ground. Hector sprang forward to take Amphimachus's helmet from off his temples, and in a moment Ajax threw a spear at him, but did not wound him, for he was encased all over in his terrible armor. Nevertheless, the spear struck the boss of his shield with such force as to drive him back from the two corpses, which the Achaeans then drew off. Stichius and Menentheus, captains of the Athenians, bore away Amphimachus to the host of the Achaeans, while the two brave and impetuous Ajaxes did the like by Imbrius. As two lions snatch a goat from the hounds that have it in their fangs, and bear it through thick brushwood high above the ground in their jaws, thus did the Ajaxes bear aloft the body of Imbrius, and strip it of its armor. Then the son of Oileus severed the head from the neck in revenge for the death of Amphimachus, and sent it whirling over the crowd as though it had been a ball, till it fell in the dust at Hector's feet. Neptune was exceedingly angry that his grandson Amphimachus should have fallen. He therefore went to the tents and ships of the Achaeans to urge the Danaans still further, and to devise evil for the Trojans. Idomeneus met him as he was taking leave of a comrade who had just come from the fight wounded in the knee. His fellow soldiers bore him off the field, and Idomeneus, having given orders to the physician, went on to his tent, for he was still thirsting for battle. Neptune spoke in the likeness and with the voice of Thoas, son of Andraemon, who ruled the Aetolians and all Pleuron and Halcaldeon, and was honored among his people as though he were a god. Idomeneus, said he, lawgiver to the Cretans, what has now become of the threats with which the sons of the Achaeans used to threaten the Trojans? And Idomeneus, chief among the Cretans, answered, Thoas, no one, so far as I know, is in fault, for we can all fight. None are held back, neither by fear nor slackness, but it seems to be the will of Almighty Jove that the Achaeans should perish ingloriously here far from Argos. You, Thoas, have always been staunch, and you keep others in heart if you see any fail in duty. Be not then remiss now, but exhort all to do their utmost. To this, Neptune, lord of the earthquake, made answer, Idomeneus, may he never return from Troy, but remain here for the dogs to batten upon, who is this day willfully slack in fighting. Get your armor and go. We must make haste all together if we may be of any use, though we are only two. Even cowards gain courage from companionship, and we two can hold our own with the bravest. Therewith the god went back into the thick of the fight, and Idomeneus, when he had reached his tent, donned his armor, grasped his two spears, and sallied forth. As the lightning which the son of Saturn brandishes from bright Olympus when he should show a sign to mortals, and its gleam flashes far and wide, even so did his armor gleam about him as he ran. Meriones, his sturdy squire, met him while he was still near his tent, for he was going to fetch his spear. And Idomeneus said, Meriones, fleet son of Molus, best of comrades, why have you left the field? Are you wounded? And is the point of the wet and hurting you? Or have you been sent to fetch me? I want no fetching. I had far rather fight than stay in my tent. 
Idomeneus, answered Meriones. I come for a spear, if I can find one in my tent. I have broken the one I had in throwing it at the shield of Deophobus. And Idomeneus, captain of the Cretans, answered, You will find one spear, or twenty if you please, standing up again the end wall of my tent. I have taken them from Trojans who I am killed, for I am not one to keep my enemy at arm's length. Therefore I have spears, boss shields, helmets, and burnished corslets. Then Meriones said, I too in my tent and at my ship have spoils taken from the Trojans, but they are not at hand. I have been at all times valorous, and wherever there has been hard fighting have held my own among the foremost. There may be those among the Achaeans who do not know how I fight, but you know it well enough yourself. Idomeneus answered, I know you for a brave man, you need not tell me. If the best men at the ships were being chosen to go on an ambush, and there is nothing like this for showing what a man is made of, it comes out then who is cowardly and who brave. The coward will change color at every touch and turn. He is full of fears and keeps shifting his weight first on one knee and then on the other. His heart beats fast as he thinks of death, and one can hear the chattering of his teeth. Whereas the brave man will not change color nor be frightened on finding himself in an ambush, but is all the time longing to go into action. If the best men were being chosen for such a service, no one could make light of your courage nor feats of arms. If you were struck by a dart or smitten in close combat, it would not be from behind, in your neck nor back. But the weapon would hit you in the chest or belly as you were pressing forward to place in the front ranks. But let us no longer stay here talking like children, lest we be ill-spoken of. Go, fetch your spear from the tent at once. On this, Meriones, peer of Mars, went to the tent and got himself a spear of bronze. He then followed after Idomeneus, big with great deeds of valor. As when baneful Mars sallies false to battle, his son Panic, so strong and dauntless, goes with him to strike terror even into the heart of a hero. The pair have gone from Thrace to arm themselves among the Ephiri, or the brave Phlegians, but they will not listen to both the contending hosts and will give victory to one side or the other. Even so did Meriones and Idomeneus, captains of men, go out to battle clad in their bronze armors. Meriones was first to speak. Son of Deucalion, said he, where would you have us begin fighting? On the right wing of the host, in the center, or on the left wing, where I take it the Achaeans will be the weakest? Idomeneus answered, There are others to defend the center, the two Ajaxes and Teucer, who is the finest archer of all the Achaeans, and is good also in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. These will give Hector son of Priam enough to do. Fight as he may, he will find it hard to vanquish their indomitable fury, and the fire of the ships, unless the son of Saturn fling a firebrand upon them with his own hand. Great Ajax, son of Telamon, will yield to no man who is in mortal mode and eats the grain of Ceres, if bronze and great stones can overthrow him. He would not yield even to Achilles in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and in fleetness of foot there is none to beat him. Let us turn, therefore, towards the left wing, that we may know forthwith whether we are to give glory to some other, or he to us. Meriones, peer of fleet Mars, then led the way till they came to the part of the host which Idomeneus had named. Now, when the Trojans saw Idomeneus coming on like a flame of fire, him and his squire clad in their richly wrought armor, they shouted and made towards him all in a body, and a furious hand-to-hand -hand fight raged under the ship's sterns, fierce as the shrill winds that whistle upon a day when dust lies deep on the roads, and the gust raise it into a thick cloud. Even such was the fury of combat, and might and main did they hack at each other with spear and swords throughout the host. The field bristled with the long and deadly spears which they bore. Dazzling was the sheen of their gleaming helmets, their fresh burnished breastplates and glittering shields as they joined battle with one another. Iron indeed must be his courage who could take pleasure in the sight of such a turmoil and look on it without being dismayed. Thus did the two mighty sons of Saturn devise evil for mortal heroes. Jove was minded to give victory to the Trojans and to Hector so as to do honor to the fleet Achilles. Nevertheless, he did not mean to utterly overthrow the Achaeans' host before Ilias and only wanted to glorify Thetis and her valiant son. Neptune, on the other hand, went about the Argives to incite them, having come up from the gray sea in secret, for he was grieved at seeing them vanquished by the Trojans, and he was furiously angry with Jove. Both were of the same race and country, but Jove was the elder born and knew more. Therefore, Neptune feared to defend the Argives openly, but in the likeness of man he kept on encouraging them throughout their host. Thus then did these two devise a knot of war and battle that none could unloose or break, and set both sides tugging at it to the failing of men's needs beneath them. And now Idomeneus, though his hair was already flecked with gray, called loud on the Danans and spread panic among the Trojans as he leaped in among them. He slew Othryonus from Cabesius, a sojourner, who had but lately come to take part in the war. 
He sought Cassandra, the fierce of Priam's daughters, in marriage, but offered no gifts of wooing, for he promised a great thing, to wit, that he would drive the sons of the Achaeans willy-nilly from Troy. Old King Priam had given his consent and promised her to him, whereon he fought on the strength of the promises thus made to him. Idomeneus aimed a spear and hit him as he came striding on. His cuirass of bronze did not protect him, and the spear stuck in his belly so that he fell heavily to the ground. Then Idomeneus vaunted over him, saying, Othryonus, there is no one in the world whom I shall admire more than I do you, if you indeed perform what you have promised Priam, son of Dardanius, in return for his daughter. We too will make you an offer. We will give you the loveliest daughter of the son of Atreus, and will bring her from Argos for you to marry, if you will sack the goodly city of Ilius in company with ourselves. So come along with me, that we may make a covenant at the ships about the marriage, and we will not be hard upon you about gifts of wooing. With this, Idomeneus began dragging him by the foot through the thick of the fight, but Asius came up to protect the body on foot, in front of his horses, which his esquire drove so close behind him that he could feel their breath upon his shoulder. He was longing to strike down Idomeneus, but ere he could do so, Idomeneus smote him with a spear in the throat under the chin, and the bronze point went clean through it. He fell as an oak, or poplar, or pine, which shipwrights have felled for ship's timbers upon the mountain with wetted axes. Even thus did he lie in full length in front of his chariot and horses, grinding his teeth and clutching at the blood-stained dust. His charioteer was strict with panic and did not dare turn his horses round and escape. Thereupon Atalochus had him in the middle of the body with a spear. His cuirass of bronze did not protect him, and his spear stuck in his belly. He fell gasping from his chariot, and Atalochus, great Nestor's son, drove his horses from the Trojans to the Achaeans. Deophobus then came close up to Idomeneus to avenge Asius and took aim at him with a spear, but Idomeneus was on the lookout and avoided it, for he was covered by the round shield he always bore, a shield of oxhide and bronze with two arm rods on the inside. He crouched under cover of this, and the spear flew over him, but the shield rang out as the spear grazed it, and the weapon sped not in vain from the strong head of Deophobus, for it struck Hypsenor, son of Hippasus, shepherd of his people, and the liver under the midriff, and his limbs failed beneath him. Deophobus vaunted over him and cried with a loud voice, saying, Of a truth, Asius has not fallen unavenged. He will be glad even while passing into the house of Hades, strong warden of the gate, that I have sent someone to escort him. Thus did he vaunt, and the Argives were stung by his saying. Noble Antilochus was more angry than anyone, but grief did not make him forget his friend and comrade. He ran up to him, bestrode him, and covered him with his shield. Then two of his staunch comrades, Mesistes, son of Achinus, and Aliastor, stooped down and bore him away, groaning heavily to the ships. But Idomeneus ceased not his fury. He kept on striving continually either to enshroud some Trojan in the darkness of death, or himself to fall while warding off the evil day from the Achaeans. Then fell Alcathius, son of Nobaestes. He was son-in-law to Anchises, having married his eldest daughter Hippodamea, who was the darling of her father and mother, and extolled all her generation in beauty, accomplishments, and understanding, wherefore the bravest man in all Troy had taken her to wife. Him did Neptune lay low by the hand of Idomeneus, blinding his bright eye and binding his strong limbs in fetters, so that he could neither go back nor to one side, but sit stock still like a pillar or lofty tree, when Idomeneus struck him with a spear in the middle of his chest. The coat of mail that had hitherto protected his body was now broken, and rang harshly as the spear tore through it. He fell heavily to the ground, and the spear stuck in his heart, which still beat, and made the butt end of the spear quiver till dread Mars put an end to his life. Idomeneus vaunted over him and crowd with a loud voice, saying, Deophobus, since you are in a mood to vaunt, shall we cry quits now that we have killed three men to your one? Nay, sir. Stand and fight with me yourself, that you may learn what manner of Jove begotten man am I that have come hither. Jove first begot Minos, chief ruler in Crete, and Minos in turn begot a son, the noble Decalion. Decalion begot me to be a ruler over many men in Crete, and my ships have now brought me hither, to be the bane of yourself, your father, and the Trojans. Thus did he speak, and Deophobus was in two minds, whether to go back and fetch some other Trojan to help him, or to take up the challenge single-handed. In the end, he deemed it best to go and fetch Aeneas, whom he found standing in the rear, for he had long been aggrieved with Priam, because in spite of his brave deeds, he did not give him his due share of honor. Deophobus went up to him and said, Aeneas, prince among Trojans, if you know any ties of kinship, help me now to defend the body of your sister's husband. Come with me to the rescue of Alcathius, who being husband to your sister, brought you up when you were a child in his house, and now Idomeneus has slain him. 
With these words he moved the heart of Aeneas, and he went in pursuit of Idomeneus, big with great deeds of valor. But Idomeneus was not to be thus daunted as though he were a mere child. He held his ground as a wild boar at bay upon the mountains, who abides the coming of a great crowd of men in some lonely place. The bristles stand up upon his back, his eyes flash fire, and he wets his tusks in his eagerness to defend himself against hounds and men. Even so did famed Idomeneus hold his ground and budge not at the coming of Aeneas. He cried aloud to his comrades, looking toward Asclepius, Atherius, Diopoulos, Mironis, and Atilochus, all of them brave soldiers. Hither, my friends, he cried, and leave me not single-handed. I go in great fear by fleet Aeneas, who is coming against me and is a redoubtable dispenser of death battle. Moreover, as he is in the flower of youth when a man's strength is greatest, if I was of the same age as he is and in my present mind, either he or I shall soon bear away the prize of victory. On this, all of them as one man stood near him, shield on shoulder. Aeneas on the other side called to his comrades, looking towards Diophobus, Paris, and the Agenor, who were the legions of the Trojans along with himself. And the people followed them as sheep follow the ram when they go down to the drink after they have been feeding, and the heart of the shepherd is glad. Even so was the heart of Aeneas glad when he saw his people follow him. Then they fought furiously in close combat about the body of Alcathus, wielding the long spears, and the bronze armors about their bodies rang fearfully as they took aim at one another in the press of the fight, while the two heroes Aeneas and Idomeneus, peers of Mars, outvied everyone in their desire to hack at each other with sword and spear. Aeneas took aim first, but Idomeneus was on the lookout and avoided the spear, so that it sped from Aeneas' strong hand in vain and fell quivering in the ground. Idomeneus, meanwhile, smote Onimalus in the middle of his belly and broke the plate of his corslet, whereupon his bowels came gushing out as he clutched the earth in the palms of his hands as he fell sprawling in the dust. Idomeneus drew his spear out of his body, but could not strip him of the rest of his armor for the rain of darts that were showered upon him. Moreover, his strength was now beginning to fail him, so that he could no longer charge, and could no longer spring forward to recover his own weapon, nor swerve aside to avoid one that was aimed at him. Therefore, though he still defended himself in hand-to-hand -hand fight, his heavy feet could not bear him swiftly out of the battle. Diophobus aimed a spear at him as he was retreating slowly from the field, for his bitterness against him was as fierce as ever, but again he missed him, and hit Ascalphus, the son of Mars. The spear went through his shoulder, and he clutched the earth in the palms of his hands as he fell sprawling in the dust. Grim Mars of awful voice did not yet know that his son had fallen, for he was sitting on the summits of Olympus under the golden clouds by command of Jove, where the other gods were also sitting, forbidden to take part in the battle. Meanwhile, men fought furiously about the body. Diophobus tore the helmet from off his head, but Moronis sprang upon him and struck him on the arm with a spear so that the visored helmet fell from his hand and came ringing down upon the ground. Therefore, Moronis sprang upon him like a vulture, drew a spear from his shoulder, and fell back under the cover of his men. Then Polites, own brother of Diophobus, passed his arms around his waist and bore him away from the battle till he got to his horses that were standing in the rear with the chariot and their driver. These took him towards the city, groaning and in great pain, with blood flowing from his arm. The others still fought on, and the battle cry rose to heaven without ceasing. Aeneas sprang on Aetherius, son of Calater, and struck him with a spear in his throat, which was turned towards him. His head fell on one side, his helmet and shield came down along him, and death, life's foe, was shed around him. Antilochus spied his chance, flew forward towards Thune and wounded him as he was turning round. He laid open the vein that runs all the way up the back of the neck. He cut this vein clean away through its whole course, and soon fell in the dust, face upwards, stretching out his hands imploringly towards his comrades. Antilochus sprang upon him and stripped the armor from his shoulders, glaring round him fearfully as he did so. The Trojans came about him on every side and struck his broad and gleaming shield, but could not wound his body, for Neptune stood guard over the son of Nestor, though the darts fell thickly round him. He was never clear of the foe, but was always in the thick of the fight. His spear was never idle. He poised and aimed it in every direction, so eager was he to hit someone from a distance or to fight him hand to hand. As he was thus aiming among the crowd, he was seen by Adamus, son of Asius, who rushed toward him and struck him with a spear in the middle of his shield. But Neptune made his point without effect, for he grudged him the life of Antilochus. One half, therefore, of the spear stuck fast like a charred stake in Antilochus's shield, while the other lay on the ground. Adamus then sought shelter under cover of his men, but Meriones followed after him and hit him with a spear midway between the private parts and the navel, where a wound is particularly painful to wretched mortals. 
There did Meriones transfix him, and he writhed convulsively about the spear of some bull, whom mountain herdsmen have bound with ropes and wise and are taking away perforce. Even so did he move convulsively for a while, but not for very long, till Meriones came up and drew the spear out of his body, and his eyes were veiled in darkness. Helenus then struck Deopryrus with a great Thracian sword, hitting him on the temple in close combat and tearing the helmet from his head. The helmet fell to the ground, and one of those who were fighting on the Achaean side took charge of it as it rolled at his feet, but the eyes of Deopyrus were closed in the darkness of death. On this Menelaus was grieved, and made menacingly towards Helenus, brandishing his spear. But Helenus drew his bow, and the two attacked one another at the same moment, the one with his spear and the other with his bow and arrow. The son of Priam hit the breastplate to Menelaus' corslet, but the hour glanced from it. As black beans or pulse coming pattering down onto a threshing floor from the broad winnowing shovel, blown by shrill winds and shaken by the shovel, even so did the arrow glance off and recoil from the shield of Menelaus, who in his turn wounded the hand which which Helenus carried his bow. The spear went right through his hand and stuck in the bow itself, so that to his life he retreated under cover of his men with his hand dragging by his side. For the spear weighed it down till Agenor drew it out and bound the hand carefully in a woolen sling which his esquire had with him. Pisander then made straight at Menelaus, his evil destiny luring him on to his doom, for he was to fall and fight with you, O Menelaus. When the two were hard by one another, the spear of the son of Atreus turned aside and he missed his aim. Pisander then struck the shield of brave Menelaus but could not pierce it, for the shield stayed the spear and broke the shaft. Nevertheless, he was glad and made sure of victory. Forthwith, however, the son of Atreus drew his sword and sprang upon him. Pisander then seized the bronze battle axe with his long and polished handle of olive wood that hung by his side under his shield, and the two made at one another. Pisander struck the peak of Menelaus's crested helmet just under the crest itself, and Menelaus hit Pisander as he was coming towards him on the forehead just at the rise of his nose. The bones cracked, and his two gore-bedrabbled eyes fell by his feet in the dust. He fell backward to the ground, and Menelaus sent his heel upon him, stripped him of his armor, and vaunted over him, saying, Even thus shall you Trojans leave the ships of the Achaeans, proud and insatiate of battle though you be, nor shall you lack any of the disgrace and shame which you have heaped upon yourself. Cowardly she-wolves that you are, you feared not the anger of dread Jove, avenger of violated hospitality, who will one day destroy your city. You stole my wedded wife and wickedly carried off much treasure when you were her guest, and now you would fling fire upon our ships and kill our heroes. A day will come when, rage as you may, you shall be stayed. O oh, Father Jove, you, who they say art above all, both gods and men in wisdom, and from whom all things that befall us do proceed, how can you thus favor the Trojans, men so proud and overweening that they are never tired of fighting? All things pall after a while, sleep, love, sweet song, and stately dance. Still, these are the things of which a man would surely have his fill rather than a battle, whereas it is a battle that the Trojans are insatiate. So saying, Menelaus stripped the blood-stained armor from the body of Pisander and handed it over to his men. Then he again ranged himself among those who were in the front of the fight. Harpalion, son of King Palamenus, then sprang upon him. He had come to fight at Troy along with his father, but he did not go home again. He struck the middle of Menelaus' shield with a spear but could not pierce it, and to save his life drew back under cover of his men, looking round him on every side lest he should be wounded. But Meriones aimed a bronze-tipped arrow at him as he was leaving the field, and hit him on the right buttock. The arrow pierced the bone through and through and penetrated the bladder, so he sat down where he was and breathed his last in the arms of his comrades, stretched like a worm upon the ground and watering the earth with blood that flowed from his wounds. The brave Paphlagonians tended him with all due care. They raised him into his chariot and bore him sadly off to the city of Troy. His father went also with him, weeping bitterly, but there was no ransom that could bring his dead son to life again. Paris was deeply grieved by the death of Harpalion, who was his host when he went among the Paphlagonians. He aimed an arrow, therefore, in order to avenge him. Now there was a certain man named Eucanor, son of Polyides the prophet, a brave man and wealthy, whose home was in Corinth. This Eucanor had set sail for Troy well knowing that it would be the death of him, for his good old father Polydeus had often told him that he must either stay at home and die of a terrible disease, or go with the Achaeans and perish at the hands of the Trojans. He chose, therefore, to avoid incurring the heavy fine the Achaeans would have laid upon him, and at the same time to escape the pain and suffering of disease. Paris now smote him on the jaw under his ear, whereon the life went out of him, and he was enshrouded in the darkness of death. Thus then did they fight as it were a flaming fire, but Hector had not yet heard, 
and did not know that the Argives were making havoc of his men on the left wing of the battle, where the Achaeans ere long would have triumphed over them, so vigorously did Neptune cheer them on and help them. He therefore held on at the point where he had first forced his way through the gates and the wall, after breaking through the serried ranks of Danian warriors. It was here that the ships of Ajax and Protoselius were drawn up on the seashore. Here the wall was at its lowest, and the fight both of man and horse raged most fiercely. The Boeotians and Ionians with their long tunics, the Locrians, the men of Phythia, and the famous force of the Apeans could hardly stay Hector as he rushed on towards the ships, nor could they drive him from them, for he was as a wall of fire. The chosen men of the Athenians were in the van, led by Menistheus son of Pedios, with whom were the also Phaedrus, Stichius, and stalwart Bias. Meges, the son of Phileus, Amphion, and Dracius commanded the Apeans, while Medion and Stans Podarces led the men of Phythia. Of these, Medon was bastard son to Oileus and brother of Ajax, but he lived in Phylace away from his own country, for he had killed the brother of his stepmother Oropus, the wife of Oileus. The other Podarces was the son of Iphclus, son of Flaccus. The two stood in the van of the Theans, then defended the ships along with the Boeotians. Ajax, son of Oileus, never for a moment left the side of Ajax, son of Telamon. But as the two swart oxen both strain their utmost at the plow which they are drawing in a fallow field, and the sweat steams upward from about the roots of their horns, nothing but the yoke divides them as they break up the ground till they reach the end of the field. Even so did the two Ajaxes stand shoulder to shoulder by one another. Many and brave comrades followed the son of Telamon to relieve him of his shield when he was overcome with sweat and toil. But the Locrians did not follow so close after the son of Oileus, for they could not hold their own in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. They had no bronze helmets with plumes of horsehair, neither had they the shields nor ashen spears, but they had come to Troy armed with bows and with slings of twisted wool from which they showered their missiles to break the ranks of the Trojans. The others, therefore, with their heavy armor, bore the brunt of the fight with the Trojans and with Hector, while the Locrians shot from behind under their cover, and thus the Trojans began to lose heart, for the arrows threw them into confusion. The Trojans would now have been driven in a sorry plight from the ships and tent back to windy Ilias, had not Polydamus presently said to Hector, Hector, there is no persuading you to take advice. Because heaven has so richly endowed you with the arts of war, you think that you must therefore excel others in counsel, but you cannot thus claim preeminence in all things. Heaven has made one man an excellent soldier, of another it has made a dancer, or a singer and a player on the lyre. While yet in another Jove has implanted a wise understanding of which men reap fruit to the saving of many, and he himself knows more about it than anyone. Therefore I will say what I think will be best. The fight has hemmed you in as with a circle of fire, and even now that the Trojans are within the wall, some of them stand aloof in full armor, while others are fighting scattered and outnumbered near the ships. Draw back, therefore, and call your chieftains round you, that we may advise together whether to fall now upon the ships, in the hope that heaven may vouchsafe us victory, or to beat a retreat while we can yet safely do so. I greatly fear the Achaeans will pay us their debt of yesterday in full, for there is one abiding at their ships who is never weary of battle, and who will not hold aloof much longer. Thus spoke Polydamus, and his words pleased Hector well. He sprang in full armor from his chariot and said, Polydamus, gather the chieftains here. I will go yonder into the fight, but will return at once when I have given them their orders. He then spied onward, towering like a snowy mountain, and with a loud cry flew through the ranks of the Trojans and their allies. When they heard his voice, they all hastened to gather round Polydamus, the excellent son of Pantheos. But Hector kept on among the foremost, looking everywhere to find Deophobus and Prince Helenus, Adamus, son of Asius, and Asius, son of Hercticus, living indeed, and scatheless he could no longer find them, for the last two were lying by the sterns of the Achaean ships, slain by the archives, while the others had also been stricken and wounded by them. But upon the left wing of the dread battle, he found Alexandrus, husband of lovely Helen, cheering his men and urging them on to fight. He went up to him and upbraided him. Paris, said he, evil-hearted Paris, fair to see but woman mad and false of tongue. Where are Deophobus and King Helenus? Where are Adamus son of Asius and Asius son of Hercticus? Where too is Othryoneus? Ilias is undone and will now surely fall. Alexandrus answered, Hector, why find fault when there is no one to find fault with? I should hold aloof from battle on any day rather than this, for my mother bore me with nothing of the coward about me. From the moment when you set our men fighting about the ships, and we have been staying here and doing battle with the Danians, our comrades about whom you asked me are dead. Deophobus and King Helenus alone have left the field, wounded both of them in the hand, but the son of Saturn saved them alive. 
Now, therefore, lead on where you would have us go, and we will follow with right good will. You shall not find us value in so far as our strength holds out. But no man can do more than in him lies, no matter how willing he may be. With these words, he satisfied his brother, and the two went towards the part of the battle where the fight was thickest, about Sebriones, brave Polydamus, Phlaces, Ortheus, godlike Polyphetes, Palmus, Ascanius, and Morris, son of Hippotion, who had come from fertile Ascania on the preceding day to relieve other troops. Then Jove urged them on to fight. They flew forth like the blasts from some fierce wind that strike earth in the van of a thunderstorm. They debuffet the salt sea into an uproar. Many and mighty are the great waves that come crashing in one after the other upon the shore with their arching heads all crested with foam. Even so did rank behind rank of Trojans, arrayed in gleaming armor, follow their leaders onward. The way was led by Hector, son of Priam, peer of murderous Mars, with his round shield before him, his shield of ox hide covered with plates of bronze, and his gleaming helmet upon his temples. He kept stepping forward under cover of his shield in every direction, making trial of the ranks to see if they would give way before him, but he could not daunt the courage of the Achaeans. Ajax was the first to stride out and challenge him. Sir, he cried, draw near. Why do you think thus vainly to dismay the Argives? We Achaeans are excellent soldiers, but the scourge of Jove has fallen heavily upon us. Your heart, forsooth, is set on destroying our ships, but we too have hands that can keep you at bay, and your own fair town shall be soon taken and sacked by ourselves. The time is near when you shall pray, Jove, and all the gods in your flight, that your steeds may be swifter than the hawks as they raise the dust on the plain and bear you back to the city. As he was thus speaking, a bird flew by upon his right hand, and the host of the Achaeans shouted, for they took heart at the omen. But Hector answered, Ajax, braggart and false of tongue, would that I were as sure of being son forevermore to Aegis-bearing Jove, with Queen Juno for my mother, and of being held in like honor with Minerva and Apollo, as I am that this day is big with the destruction of the Achaeans, and you shall fall among them if you dare abide my spear." It shall rend your fair body and bid your glut our hounds and birds of prey with your fat and your flesh as you fall by the ships of the Achaeans. With these words, he led the way and the others followed after with a war cry that rent the air while the host shouted behind them. The Argives on their part raised a shout likewise, nor did they forget their prowess but stood firm against the onslaught of the Trojan chieftains, and the cry from both the host rose up to heaven and to the brightness of Jove's presence. End of Book 13. Recording by M. L. Cohen, www.mojomove411.com, Cleveland, Ohio, November 2007.